There are certain conversations that one has frequently as pastor, and one of them that comes around fairly often is, gee, pastor, I need to talk to you. I'm really upset. And with that being said, that can go a lot of different directions or be a lot of things. But one that I hear pretty often when people are upset, a lot of the time people are upset by everything that's going on in the world. It's just sometimes overwhelming. You know, we, we just hear about so many things that are wrong all the time, and it overwhelms us. And it's not coincidence that I have this conversation with people most often around election times when people are just really upset that they don't have the candidates that they want being elected into office. And a lot of the time these things can feel overwhelming, but the one remedy that I've found for it is I often ask, well, how much news are you watching? And then most often the answer is the news is on all the time in my house. Or I turn the news on when I get home from work and I turn it off when I go to bed. Saying like, gosh, how many, how many hours of news is that? And then I say, I have a suggestion for you. I know it's important to stay informed, but just try turning it off for the next week or so and see how you do. See if, see if you're feeling less overwhelmed and stressed out about it. And almost every time I say this, I'll you know, see that person on the following Sunday and say, how are you feeling about everything now? Did you leave the news off or at least cut back on it? Yeah, and I'm feeling better. <coughs> And it's kind of funny how that works. And with it being said that I've had that conversation over and over many, many times, people cutting back on it or turning on giving themselves a break from the news helps them feel better. It teaches us this, that what we're watching and allowing into our lives affects us. Doesn't it? You might not think it you might not think things affect you but the things you're seeing the things you're hearing about affect you even if it has nothing to do with you that's why sometimes if you see something traumatic happen to somebody else if you witness a car accident or an accident at work you even though it's a stranger even though you don't know this person and it doesn't affect you, you could still have PTSD from that incident of what you saw. And what the Bible tells us is to be careful about what we let into our lives. Now, while I said the news, maybe you shouldn't turn it all off. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. I found just personally, I feel better about things going to this day and age, a news website where I could scan and read the things that look important rather than being overwhelmed with it and taking it all in. When we've been going through the Beatitudes, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, greatest sermon ever preached it's widely considered to be beatitude means supreme blessedness supreme blessing and happiness which i think all of us want to be supremely blessed and supremely happy and some of them are confusing about how that works so we've been talking about them but today's is Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So we're going to talk about what that means, but let's read the whole list in Matthew chapter 5. 
Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down, this being Jesus. And his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's one of the most confusing, I think. Blessed are the poor. Well, I thought blessings were riches. Luke just leaves it at that. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You don't have to have it all for God to be blessing you. Poor in spirit, as Matthew puts it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, knowing that we have absolute spiritual poverty without God. The Bible's very clear that we cannot save ourselves, but need the grace of God to save us. Through faith, so that no man may boast, the Bible says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's in our, often in our darkest moments of sadness where God draws nearest to us. And here Jesus gives us permission and even encouragement to mourn when we go through something sad. And Christians have it wrong when they say, just always, no matter what happens, turn that frown upside down. Sometimes we're meant to be sad and there's not really happiness without sadness. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Talking about humility and gentleness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We need to always be hungry and thirsty for God. As the most interesting man in the world says, stay thirsty, my friends. But not thirsty for Dos Equis. Thirsty for righteousness. Thirsty for the Lord. There's something wrong in our lives where it's like, meh, I haven't prayed in a while. I haven't opened my Bible in a while. I haven't been to church in a while. I haven't really thought about God in a while. It's just, just been busy and distracted with too many other things. I think that's the devil's the greatest tool is just distracting us and making us overly busy so that there's no room in our lives left for God. I think that works better and affects more people than just tempting us with a sin to go and do. Just, huh, I'm just, you just ignore God. Not that you've chosen to ignore God or thought God's not a priority anymore, or right now anyway, but just being so distracted with other things and so busy that there's no room for him. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God shows us so much mercy and forgiveness and calls us to go and do likewise to other people, to give other people mercy and grace, even when they don't deserve it. Then, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, pure in heart, what does that mean? Well, the Bible calls us to have purity in our lives. One interesting thing that the Bible says in a lot of different verses is that God does not listen to the prayers of the wicked. And maybe that's stating the obvious, but it's not obvious. How many times have I heard people say, well, God's not answering my prayers. I'm mad at him when it's when it's a friend of mine and I know that they're not doing anything in their lives to try to please God or follow him, that they're way off track, but yet they have the audacity to believe that God's going to do this for them and do that for them. Well, it doesn't always work that way. If God not hearing the prayers of the wicked, yet the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
So that's, that's one of those things we have to look at in our lives before God. Do I have any sin that I've not repented of? Repentance means not just saying you're sorry, but doing a 180 degree turn and not, not doing the thing anymore that you're doing. Making sure that the Bible tells us that sin gets between us and God. If you think about, think about it like a radio frequency between you and the Lord that has an obstruction in it. You ever use a walkie-talkie or a CB radio? Yeah, they always say on the package, I bought radios to take hunting with me to stay in communication with the people I'm with. But one of those things, it says on the package that it has a 28 mile range. And sometimes you get frustrated when, you know, it's, it's breaking up and you can't hear the person and you know you're less than a mile apart. Well, the, what's advertised is um, being in a clear, unobstructed place. That's probably, you're probably only going to get 28 miles if you're in the ocean or out on a lake on a boat where it's just clear water and no wind, <laughs> nothing in the way. You're hunting in the mountains. There's a lot of trees in the way mountains in the way so you're not going to get very far and the bible tells us that sin is an obstruction between us and god but fortunately you can get rid of it by repenting and asking the lord to forgive you of your sins because jesus has paid the penalty for them so one of the first things with being pure in heart for they will see god if god not even going to hear you because of sin in your life then how in the world are you going to see him well doesn't always doesn't always work that way so besides dealing with our sin how else do we have purity of heart well purity is defined as the absence of contamination you ever do the wordless book? The wordless book was, it's an old evangelism tool. And it, it shows, just shows blank pages. The first page is black. And that our heart is black with sin. Right? But we need it white. Free of contamination. Washed white as snow. How do we get it? Then there's the red. And the red's Jesus' blood that cleanses us from our sins. His sacrifice where he took his sins upon himself so that we might be forgiven. And then you have the, uh, the yellow page, the gold. That, that's how you get to the streets of gold in heaven. It's an evangelism tool for kids, but we have the, word, the wordless book there. And I wanted to open to... Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, an often quoted verse, a set of verses, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brethren, what other things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learn and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So this is, this is a good list to come back to again and again of it gives a list of whatever things are true, noble, just, lovely, of good report. Think on these things. It's also a good filter of what to let into your life. 
You, sometimes I think of it in modern day terms of like a spam filter on your email that we that's supposed to weed out most of the scams and most of the solicitations so that you're not overwhelmed with them. It blocks it so that you don't have to look at them. Well, guess what? You can have that in your brain as well. A spam filter to say, you know, do I not just, it, it spills over into a lot of things, different areas. Do I need to be watching this on TV? Do I need to be looking at this or reading this on the internet? Do I need to be listening to this gossip? Do I need to be around these friends that are gossipy? Do I need to be around these people at work that are negative all the time? Now, allowing what kind of things you let into your life and into your mind, I think positive thinking is a very powerful thing. You know, we sing the songs, count your blessing. Count your blessings one by one. Name them one by one. When we start looking at all the good things in our lives, rather than all the things that are going wrong around us, it really, really affects our happiness. And the things you let into your life as well, blessed are the pure in heart. I've heard it said that you're really just the average of the people that are around you that you spend the most time with. And if they're, you know, into different stuff that's not God-honoring, it's really easy for most of us to get sucked into whatever they're doing pretty quickly. We think of peer pressure as something that affects teenagers, as they're the most vulnerable to what their friends groups are doing, but I'm not sure it's all that much better for adults. So who we're spending time with. That's why church and community is so important. You get around other godly examples. You ever get around somebody too that's just on fire for the Lord? and praising him and excited about him and wants to talk about him, well, I'll tell you that's really contagious. <laughs> as well as community being so important. I keep reading that depression is a bigger problem in our society than it's been in years past for people that report that they're sad and depressed. Especially with young people, but with all ages. And there's a direct correlation with that to loneliness, being isolated, not having a sense of community. I saw a headline yesterday that said, loneliness is as bad for you, if not worse, than smoking cigarettes. I'd never heard that before. I know loneliness and isolation is not good, but worse than being a smoker, well, that's pretty serious. People that go to church as well live longer. Why? Most researchers say it's because of the sense of community that we have that keeps us all emotionally healthier thus spilling over to being physically, he physically healthier as well. But these attitudes, maybe it's not something we think about all the time. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It's, it's something that we need. It's holiness. Holiness in our lives. Holiness that we're supposed to be pursuing. Godliness. Not just being pure on the outside and clean, as Jesus criticized the Pharisees. He called them, a word he used was whitewashed sepulchers, meaning a, 
Meaning, you ever see a nice coffin? <laughs> Sometimes I go to a funeral, you know, you go to the funeral home, or for a while, I mean, they were selling coffins at Costco. I saw one time, it was just, just weird. Um, but they're polished. I mean, the, the craftsmanship in some of these ones that cost, you know, 3000 or $5,000, it's like a nice auto body job. I mean, it's like what you see on a Corvette or a Cadillac. <laughs> and, you know, you can, uh, you can walk by and appreciate the craftsmanship of it. But what Jesus said is like, hey, don't be pretty on the outside, beautiful on the outside, but dead on the inside. And then he gave the example as well of a dish. You know, do you, do you have a bowl or a cup? And when you wash it, do you just wash the outside so that it looks good? No, of course not. You don't, you don't want a, a cup or your bowl that's disgusting on the inside, but looks nice on the outside. It's more important that you wash what's on the inside. And how do we be physically clean? I mean, one, first of all, we have the blood of Jesus wash our sins away, so we're clean before God. But then... Also important that we need to be careful with what we let in and what we're around. You ever make that mistake when you're a kid of, uh, you know, you, you, you wash your baseball uniform or something and you put your red jersey in with your white pants, <laughs> your white baseball pants? What happens? Well, everybody laughs at you because you have pink pants. <laughs> It's kind of funny. I coached Christopher's little league team last year, so I got to pick what color belt they have and what color socks they have and what color pants they have so that all the team matches. So now you could get gray pants, which I don't remember that being an option at all when I played, so no kid has to go through that humiliation if they're on my team. <laughs> So that's like the white, the color of purity, which is white, can't really be mixed with other bright colors very well, or they're going to get stained. Another thing in, uh, you see in the Bible with worship, now Levitical law that's part of the Old Testament that is not followed since Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection. But one of the things you see when people would go to the temple in Jerusalem, you had to do certain things. You weren't supposed to go in if you were sick or had open sores. You are supposed to make sure that you were clean and healthy. And so it would instruct you to take a bath before you go to the temple. And then when you get to the temple, if you've ever seen a diagram or model of the temple, the thing at the entrance, there's a big basin of water. So what's that for? That's not for this, you know, you dip your finger and not, not in the temple, not, not the sign of the cross, but the water was in the temple so that you could wash your hands making sure you're physically clean to go in and going through a process of purity before you go into the temple. Now, we've carried over some of that tradition. I mean, like people putting on their Sunday best that we grew up with or the kids having to take their one bath for the week on Saturday night. <laughs> but... Uh, I, I hope you all do it more than that. <laughs> but, but there's the principle of being pure in heart before you come into worship. Now, nothing necessarily wrong with it, but you know, take a moment in the parking lot when you're walking in to make sure everything's good between you and the Lord. Like, God... Is there anything I need to, is there anything we need to talk about before I go into the church? You know, some, 
sometimes there is, or, or during communion, that Bible tells us to you know, deal with any of the sin in our lives before we take communion to make sure we're pure in heart. A lot of Roman Catholics do this well. It seems to be a pretty good tradition that people go to confession on Saturday nights to confess their sin for the week. Why Saturday night? Why is confession big on Saturday night? Well, because you're going to worship. You're going to church the next day. Now, we don't, we don't believe we need a priest to confess, that you can confess directly to God. It's, it's a good habit. And knowing that our sins are washed whiter than snow, we're purified through repentance, and Christ has made us pure with the cost of his life. Now, self-discipline is a big deal when it comes to purity. That, that uh, we need to have self-discipline and self-control in order to have purity in our lives. We have to have what traditional theology calls the examination of conscience, of our conscience. Examination of conscience is when we, we look at our lives and say, Hey, have I, have I done anything wrong in the last week before the Lord? It's when you look at yourself and look at your life and take stock of it. I mean, it will, it's, it's going to be different for each one of us. Is it dishonesty? Is it unforgiveness? Is it hatred? Is it bitterness? Is it, is it negative thinking? Is it lust? Is it overspending? What, what do I find in my life when I do an examination of conscience? Having a pure heart. What, what happens when we have a pure heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Psalm 24 paints a good picture of this. It says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Yes, a rhetorical question. Who may stand in his holy place? Can you ascend the hill of the Lord? We see, especially in the Old Testament, a lot of people take a hike up the mountain in order to see God. There's something powerful about it. You know, the picture of God being up here and us being down here. Can you hike up that hill? Can you stand in his holy place before a holy and righteous God? Well, you wonder, who can do that? Can I do that? Can you do that? It says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol. Like, hey, you're, you're free of idolatry in your lives. And it said that idolatry isn't just bowing down and praying to an idol and practicing other religions. Remember first commandment, no other gods before me, but a lot of things in our lives can become idols when they become more important to, than God. Things that get in the way of our relationship with God. So he who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Is it the most religious? Is it the strongest? No, it's he who has clean hands. Meaning, what do we do with our hands? That's our actions. Clean actions in our lives. And a pure heart. Being holiness in our lives. A hunger and thirst for righteousness and holiness. That's one of those things that we don't always think about. You have to guard your purity. Pursue holiness. Get rid of any of the things that are in the way of your relationship with God. That's not always an easy thing to do. It's not just a once and done. But one of those things we have to do again and again each week. As the Bible tells us, we're molded 
into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Giving the example of the potter and the clay. It's uncomfortable when you're being molded and squeezed. These things are the foundation to happiness, peace, and blessing. Now, if you don't have purity in your life, is God going to bless you? No, you're going to miss out on God's blessing. You know, we've, we've all heard the analogy that, you know, you get to heaven and God shows you all of the buckets of blessing that you didn't get that he was had there waiting to give you because, well, because of sin in your lives or because you didn't ask. God's blessing doesn't work with, you know, and anybody... Anybody like watch the Godfather movie? And we see that, and you have that with perhaps the person who goes to Mass every Sunday or confession every Saturday night that wears the big gold cross, but they're out doing things, doing illegal business and killing people the rest of the week. Sure. It, can God forgive that? Of course he can. But does that mean that if that's your lifestyle, that there aren't going to be any consequences for that? Or sometimes you see with the gangbangers, they got the big old cross here, but they're still living an unrepentant life. Sure, sure God could save him, but... Certainly they're separated from him. Certainly they're missing out on the many blessings that God might have for him or her. So we need to prepare ourselves for worship by purifying your heart. No, you'll be happier in our society living a clean life that is pure. A lot of the time, if you're living God's way, doing the things the Bible says, well, it's just going to save you a lot of heartache and consequences that you'd otherwise have. Purification comes through Christ's work and through being a disciple by exercising self-discipline and making godly habits. They say habits take about a month, give or take, about a month to really solidify you know if you're going to have your appointment with god set a time you know, when you wake up when you go to bed your lunch break whenever to have an appointment with god to read the bible and pray purity of heart and mind is necessary to be able to see god that's that's uh, what it's about. I want to see God. Do you want to see God? Amen. Amen. Let's work on that.